This is Mrs. Gorley, and this is the BC Calculus Lesson 4.3 on Absolute Extrema and then the Mean Value Theorem. So this isn't, this part, this first little part here isn't in your book yet. We'll get to your book in a minute. Um, just look at this picture up here. We've got relative and absolute extrema that we're going to talk about here. So what do you think the difference is between relative extrema and absolute? Well, first of all, what's extrema? Yeah, extreme things, so high and low points kind of thing. So high and low points there. So what do you think the difference is between relative and absolute? Would relative be an estimate or an average or like an about? It's an about, yeah, it's, it is. And it's rel what does relative mean? Like what are your relatives to you in your family? Yeah, <laughs> I guess we should be careful how we, what we, some people are like, ah, oh, don't really like those, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're relative to you. They're, they're kind of closely related. Like Isa said, they're closely related to you. So think of that as closely, a close extrema. It, a relative extrema then is an extrema that's the highest or lowest point, like just in a certain area. So like if I circle this area here, you can see that that has a maximum value of two there. Okay, that's the point negative two, three, so it's high point there is two. So relative extrema is just relative to a specific area. So relative to a small area. Okay, um, what if I had a point, say, right here? And let's say that this point is now an open point there instead of at the point two one. So if I ask you what's the um, relative extrema around that point now that I've changed it, would it still be one? What's the highest point in that specific area? Yeah, it looks like maybe about two and a half there. This is about two and 2.5. So it doesn't have to be continuous to have an extrema on it there. It's a lot easier if it is, it's easier to find it. But a relative extrema is just, if I just take a small area, what's the highest or lowest point in that small area, okay? Absolute extrema then, what do you think that would be? Like the vertex. The vertex, but which one? In fact, look at this graph. See how it has arrows going on the ends, going up forever and then down forever on the left? Do you think this has an absolute extrema then? Yeah, infinity and negative infinity. There's really not a specific number that you can say. So absolute means on the entire graph. On entire graph. Okay, so relative is just relative to a specific area. So there's lots of relative extrema. Like this one has right here is a relative maximum, right here is a relative minimum, right there is a relative maximum, right there is a relative minimum. Um, however, this particular graph, because it goes forever to the left down and forever to the right up, it has no maximum extrema, uh, or excuse me, it has no absolute extrema uh, because it goes on forever. So we can't say when you say extrema, it has to be an actual number. Um, if it's not an actual number, for the, it's a y value, a height there, then you say there isn't one. Um, so up here on definitions of extrema, we got max, minimum would be a low value, lowest value, and the maximum would be the highest value. So they can ask these in lots of different ways. Sometimes they'll say, what is the point that's the absolute extrema? Then you give the x and the y. Sometimes they say, what is the value of the absolute extrema? Then you just give the height or the y value. Sometimes they'll say, where does it occur? And you give the x value. Okay, so you just have to read the question very carefully to ask, to figure out should you give x, y, or the entire point. Most of the time it's the y value, but not always. Um, when they just say what is the extreme, it's the y value. I guess I shouldn't say most of the time because there are times when, lots of times when they just ask for the x value where it occurs. Okay, um, another word for these instead of relative would be local, which to me makes a lot of sense because a local max is just a maximum value in that local area. So local and relative mean the same exact thing. Um, 
global is like absolute, just like the entire world, global, you know? So here you can see there's a global minimum right there. We call it global minimum. It's also a local min because it's the local minimum area right around that area there. But it's a global minimum. Up here you can see the graph has a global maximum up there. And that again is also a local max. And again, we could say those are absolutes, absolute maximum in there. The rest of these, here's a local max, there's a local max. Um, max there, max. what? He said here is a max, here is a max, but he's absent. He's absent. Oh, <laughs> max is gone, yep. Max is not local today. Um, for those that don't know, we have max in the class. Anyway. Um, this is also, remember we said that's a local and a global, and this is a local and a global on, on that one. Now, endpoints are not technically, um, we don't call them a relative extrema or a local extrema or anything like that. They're just an endpoint. But an endpoint could be like a maximum value or something. Like if this graph had continued and gone, say, like up here like that and ended up here, then this would be my global maximum point there, okay? All right, um, let's see. This one right here in the middle, it's not an extreme value because you can see it goes up. Let me get a pen that we can see this on. It goes up like this, and then it doesn't um, go back down. It keeps going up. It just has a sharp point there, but at this point right here in the middle on that, it doesn't go up and then back down. So to be a local or, or a relative maximum or minimum, it has to basically go up and then down or down and then up, okay? It can't go up and then up again. All right, um, so can you tell me, looking at this graph here, get rid of all the stuff I put on there, just based on this, what is the derivative at these values here. So the derivative, how do we draw like the picture of the derivative on these graphs? A slope, yeah. So what is the slope of these points here? What is that? Zero. Yeah, it's zero. The slope is zero, but what about this one? Is the slope zero on that one? It's a sharp point. So can we take a derivative of a sharp point? No. So the derivative doesn't exist there. So basically, if you want to find where an extrema is, you just have to set the derivative equal to zero or find where does the derivative does not exist. Okay. Most of the time it's set equal to zero, but don't forget the does not exist one, that sharp, those sharp point things like that. Okay. So here's some pictures. You can see on the one on the left, um, it has open dots on the ends, open points, which means we don't include those endpoints. So there's no maximum on this then, because how, how do you say what that point is, you know, this highest value right here? Because it keeps getting closer and closer to five, but it never gets to five. So if I say it's 4.99, you're like, well, what if it's 4.999? or 4.9999, <laughs> you could just keep getting closer and closer. So if you can't say a specific value, then you say there isn't one. So you could say it's approaching five, but you can't actually say that what the actual value of the maximum is there. This one down here, it does have a minimum. Is that a um, absolute minimum or just a relative minimum? Absolute. Yeah, it's absolute because it's the lowest point overall. On this graph on the right, you can see that it's got closed dots now on these. So you can see it does have an absolute maximum. But look now down here, this, this uh, vertex down there is an uh, open dot. So therefore, it doesn't have a minimum because, you can, again, you can get infinitely close to this point here, but I, can never, I can't ever give a value that's specifically right. You know, what is it that, what is the actual y value that's closest to that? Okay, um, what if I asked you though, this picture on the right, ignore all the other stuff that it's talking about here, and I'm gonna actually just ask you what, if you took just this area right there, okay, just that area that I have in blue, 
can you tell me, does it have an absolute maximum in just that area? Or if we want to speak about it in an area, in other words, does it have a relative minimum in that area? Or maximum, sorry, not minimum. Does it have a relative maximum in that area right there? Where would it be? Yeah, when x equals 0, the value there is 2. So again, you got to look in areas like that, you could have maximums. Again, in that specific area, though, there is no relative minimum because, it, again, we've got this open dot down here. There is a relative maximum, though. Okay, just in that area. Okay, so today, though, what we're going to be talking about is absolute. Okay, we're not doing relative yet. We're just going to do absolute. So most of the time, if they ask you to find an absolute extrema for an equation, they'll give you just a closed interval. So these pictures will not be what you'll have here. It'll be more like this one on the right, but this dot here wouldn't be there, and this would be closed in. So it's like a closed interval over a, um, a continuous closed interval. So why do you think they do that? Why do they give you an, a continuous closed interval if they want you to find absolute extrema? They want an answer, yeah, exactly. They want an answer, and if they don't give you a continuous closed interval, um, you might not have an answer. So the point is, if it's continuous and it's closed, so it's got the endpoints are closed in, um, are included, then there's guaranteed to be a maximum, an absolute max and an absolute min. There might be more than one, but you have to have at least one absolute max and absolute min if it's a closed continuous interval. So that's really important is that idea of it being closed and continuous. All right, so this is your book. So you got your book? Okay, so the first um, thing on there is the definition. So we have absolute maximum or global max. It's, it's the y value. So remember, if they ask you what is the max, you say the y value. That is greater than or equal to all the other values in the function. And I don't know, does yours have, I don't know why I've got these extra little dots on here that shouldn't be there okay um and then the absolute minimum the same thing it's the y value that's less than all the other y values on the graph and relative we said is relative to a specific area um he's he uses the word nearby on there and extrema either maximums or minimums and critical numbers so this is the only one we haven't talked about critical numbers are the x values where the graph has to exist, first of all, so it has to be an x value that's on f of x. Um, but the derivative is either 0 or undefined. So just like we said before, if I want to find a relative extrema or, a rel or an absolute extrema, the graph there has to have a 0 slope or is undefined slope. That is a really good point. So are all critical numbers going to be relative or absolute extrema? What do you guys think? I think it's not kind to say that all of them are extremists. That's, and that's actually true. All of them can't be extremists. Let's go look back at our picture here and see if what we mean here. Look at this picture. Right here, does the derivative exist right there on a sharp point? No, it doesn't exist. But was that an extrema? No. But it's one that we could have tested. So what we do on these is we find all of the critical numbers. So every place where the graph either has a zero derivative or the derivative does not exist. And, of course, the original graph has to exist there. It has to be continuous there. Um, or not continuous, but it has to exist at least there. Then, then we just test each one of them and see if they are the absolute extrema. Okay, so undefined, remember, would look like a sharp point on a graph. Um, and we already talked about critical numbers there. So let's go down to the next part here. So you've got the extreme value theorem. So if f of f is, a conti is continuous on a to b, so it's some continuous closed interval, see how they have the brackets there, so it included the ends then it has to have an absolute or global minimum and an absolute or global maximum, at least one of each. It could have more than one. Um, like, for instance, if I had a graph that maybe went like this and stopped, that one would have one absolute max right there 
and two absolute minimums right there. Okay, So you could have more than one. It's just you have to have at least one. Okay, so how do we do this? So the candidate test, and last year he didn't even have this in the book. He's came up with this candidate test idea here. So um, basically it's just the process of what we're going to do here. You're going to find all the critical numbers, and then you're going to find the Y values of those critical numbers, and you have to test the endpoints because you got to remember you could have a highest point at an endpoint or a lowest point at an endpoint. So you're going to take all of the critical numbers you find, every place where the derivative was zero or didn't exist, you're going to plug it in and get the Y value, and then you're going to take the endpoints and plug them in and get those Y values, and then you just pick the highest and lowest are the, relative, the absolute maximum and minimums. Okay, so absolute extrema can occur either at critical points or endpoints. Relative extrema um, can occur only at critical numbers. So we don't call endpoints relative extrema, okay? Um, some other textbooks allow that, but his particular book here, he doesn't allow that, okay? All right. Okay, so we got a picture here. So here's our first example. Use the figure of y equals f of x at the right to answer these questions. So everybody got your pencil ready here? What is the absolute maximum of f? What do you think? Yeah, it's 4. It's right there. And the y value there is 4. So at what x value does this have an absolute maximum then? negative four. You just say the x value that went with, with it. So what is the absolute um, maximum point? Yeah, negative four, four. So that's the three different things that they can ask you about. What is it? Where is it? The x value. And then what's the point? How about the absolute minimum? Where's the absolute minimum here? Right, it doesn't have one. That's because it gets lower and lower and lower, but that's an open dot there. So we can't get say exactly where it's at. Um, so at what value does X have, let's say, at what X values does F have relative minimums? So what X values? What would they be? Negative three. Right, negative three. And where else? Two. Yep, there's a right in this area there. That's a low point. There's one more. Do you see it? One. Yeah, at one right there. Okay. All right. This is when x equals those. I guess we should say that. And this is x equals negative four up there. Usually I write the x equals when it's asking what does x values are. Okay, at what x values does f have a relative maximum? What x values would those be? relative negative one is one for sure and on the right side of the graph I don't see any over here simply because that would have been right here if it would have had a closed dot but it doesn't right so that's not one but definitely at negative one x equals negative one but why isn't negative 4, x equals negative 4, why isn't that where a relative maximum occurs? It's because it's an end. If they had said absolute, then yeah, that's fine. But relative, they just don't include the ends on this. Okay. So absolute extrema can occur either at critical numbers or endpoints, but relative extrema can only occur at critical numbers. So that's kind of an important point for you to remember there. Oh, you like my little comic? Well, doctor, I'm sorry. I'm afraid his condition is critical. Do you get it? He's a critical number. He's a, he's, his head is the, the relative maximum or minimum. Actually, the absolute minimum for him, right? Okay. So how are we going to find critical numbers? Right. We're going to set the derivative equal to zero or... Find where the derivative does not exist. OK? 
Okay. Like I said, this one doesn't come up as often, but don't forget it because that's the one that everybody forgets because they used to just, they get used to just setting the derivative equal to zero and they forget that one. And then there's always one that they sneak in there on you. Okay, so I put the candidate test up above this here again so we have it to look at. Um, so we're on number seven. We're finding the global extrema of this function here on the interval, the closed interval from negative one to three. So it's a closed interval. Um, is this continuous on that closed interval? This x cubed graph? What do you think? Is that continuous on this closed interval? How do you know? Yeah, you're not dividing by anything. There's no square root, so you're taking weird, you know, square roots and negatives. This is a polynomial. It's got just an x cubed term and an x squared term. It's a polynomial. All polynomials are continuous. All lines, parabolas, cubic functions, quartic, all of those kind of things. So this is continuous on that interval. So we know it's going to have at least one relative, or excuse me, one absolute maximum and one absolute minimum at least. All right, so let's find it. Let's take our derivative here. And first, so what we're doing first here, I'm going to put C in. We're finding the critical numbers. Find the critical numbers. So do the derivative. What do we get? X squared minus 4x. Right, x squared minus 4x. Now, what do we do with that? Set it equal to 0. Is there any place where it doesn't exist? What would the domain of this be? Right, the domain is all real numbers, so it exists everywhere because it's another, um, uh, it's a parabola, it's another polynomial, so it exists everywhere. Okay, so we set it equal to zero, let's factor an x out, and what do we get for our x values then? Right, zero and four. Now, look at our closed interval. Which ones are in the closed interval? Or which one? Are they both in the interval? No, what's the only one in the interval? Zero. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're not going to do the four. We're going to try, we're going to take f x equals zero, and then the endpoints, x equals negative one and x equals three. And we're plugging all of those in back into the original function, not in the derivative. Because if you plug them in the derivative, um, if you plug the like this one back in their derivative, you're just going to get zero, right? Because it's a critical number. You should have gotten zero for that. So remember, you have to plug these back into the original function because you're actually trying to see how high or how low is the actual graph. And so if we want y values of, or points, we've got to use our original here. So f of zero is just zero, right, when we plug that in there. So there's the point zero, zero. Um, the endpoints f of negative 1 then, plug a negative 1 in there, we get negative 1 third minus 2, which is negative 2 and 1 third, and then plug in 3. And what do we get? 9 minus 18, is that right? Or negative 9. Okay, so you have your three values there now um, for this particular one, and what is the absolute maximum zero. zero yeah here's the absolute max so absolute max is zero and the absolute min what's that absolute minimum good question yeah should we say three or negative nine negative 9, because we're actually asking what is the minimum, and that's the y value. If it says where does it occur, that's the x value. And if it says what's the point, we get the entire point. All right. So before we move on, let me just see 5 to 0. Are you getting this topic so far? Awesome. Okay, so this one, find the absolute uh, maximum and absolute minimum values of this f of x equals absolute value of x minus 2 on the interval from 0 to 5. So is this continuous from 0 to 5? Yeah, this is just the graph. Remember, what's the, what's the actual absolute value graph look like? 
just y equals absolute value of x. What's that? Yeah, it's just that v, right? Slope of 1 on the right, slope of negative 1 on the left. So what does this minus 2 do to it? Right, it shifts it right to. So it's now over here. So if we're going from 0 to 5, we're basically, it's basically this graph from 0. So what would that be at 2? My graph's a little off there. Up to 5 like that. So that's the graph that we're looking at. Is it that stuff? There we go. There's our graph. Okay, so when they give you an absolute value one, most of the time it's just a basic absolute value like this where it's just linear. Um, can you just look at it and tell me where you have absolute extrema then here? Where's an absolute minimum? At two. At two. Yeah, that's because right there at x equals two, um, f prime of x, or the derivative, is undefined. It doesn't exist, right? So that's a critical number. So x equals 3 is a critical number. That's our only critical number on this graph. Should that raise it to 2? Yes, thank you. I don't know why I said 3 on those. Let's make those 2 since that's what it is. Thank you, Isis, for catching that. Okay, so at x equals 2, that's our only critical number. Um, but we have to test, we have all three of them here. So basically we're saying what is f of 2, our critical number, and then our endpoints, what is f of 0, and what is f of 5. So you do all of them. You always show all of them, regardless if you can, if you can just look at the graph and see them. You show all of them, okay? So we know that f of 0 is 2. If we'll plug a 0 in there, you get a 2. If you plug a 5 in there, what do you get? Yeah, 3, because 5 minus 2 is 3, absolute value of 3 is 3. And then f of 2 was our 0. So you can see right there um, our relative minimum and our relative max, uh, no, excuse me, not relative, absolute. So our absolute um, minimum is equal to 0, and our absolute maximum is equal to 3. Okay. That's what their actual heights are, not what the x value where they occur at. Okay? All right, so we've got some you can do it from either an uh, equation like we did on number seven. You can do it from a graph like we did on number eight. Um, let's go to number nine then. So let's see. This is, what does this two-thirds power here mean on that graph? What does the two-thirds power mean? Cube root and x right, it's a cube root, and then you're going to square it. So it's the same thing as saying cube root of x and then square it. So if that's how we write this, just rewriting it just so that we can clarify what we're looking at, what's the domain of that? Can you take the cube root of any number? Yeah, and then square it. So this one, the domain is all reals again. Okay, the domain of that one is all reals. It exists everywhere. So it's continuous on this particular closed interval there. All right, so what do we do to find our critical numbers? Nathan, do you need to go get a drink, dude? <laughs> You're going to fall asleep. Go ahead, stand up, go get a drink if you need to. You look really tired. <laughs> Sometimes it's just too early to do math, don't you think? <laughs> All right, so let's do our derivative. When in doubt in calculus, do the derivative of something. <laughs> so what do you get when you do this derivative uh, using our power rule here? Put this guy out front. What do we get? 2x to the negative one third minus 2. There you go. 2x to the negative one third minus 2. Okay, so let's set it equal to 0. That's our first thing. So we're trying to find critical numbers here. We're going to set it equal to 0. 2 and let's, I'm going to write that as a cube root, but where should I put it? Yeah, 2 over because it's a negative, so that pulls it down into the bottom part of the fraction down in the denominator, and then we'll make the cube root into a 
or the one third power into cube root. Okay, it just makes it a little easier. You don't have to do that if you like to solve it using the other way, that's fine. Um, but I like to do it that way. Okay, so we'll add two to both sides. And then if I multiply the cube root of x on both sides, then it's off the bottom there, right? So I have two cube root of x equals two and divide by two. So we get the cube root of x is equal to one. Well, then what? How do you undo cube root? Yeah, cube it. So if you cube it, you get x equals one. Is that in our interval? Yeah, so that's a critical number. So we found a critical number, but is it the only critical number? What do you think? Remember we said at the beginning, to find these, we're gonna set these equal, the derivative equal to zero, and what else? And the endpoints, we gotta check the endpoints, but finding critical numbers. So remember, finding critical numbers, critical numbers are not endpoints. Finding critical numbers is when we take the derivative and we set it equal to zero, and what else with the derivative? Where it doesn't exist. So this particular one, because the original function existed everywhere, but can you see by looking at this right there, or this one, either one, where does this not exist? What value are you not allowed to plug in for x? Zero, yeah, because you can't divide by zero. So x cannot equal zero. That's where f prime of x is undefined. Okay, so our critical numbers are not only x equals one, but also a critical number at x equals zero. It's that sharp point. If you actually graph this um, graph right here, you'd see that at zero, it has this sharp point. It comes in, it looks, I don't know exactly what it looks like, but it comes in, it looks something like that, where it has this sharp point coming in there, okay? All right, we'll have to throw it in the calculator and see. Put it in your calculator, see what it looks like. Okay, so that's what it looks like, but we don't really need to know that. Um, if you were doing relative extrema, it'd be nice to know what it looked like, but all you need really, you don't need to know what it looks like at all. You just have to find all the critical numbers, and then you take those and the endpoints up there, and you just plug them back into F. So if we go back to F, and we do F of one, and f of zero, those are our critical numbers. And then we do f of negative one for the endpoints and f of three. Just plug them all back into f there and see what you get. If you plug in a zero, that one's easy, you get zero. If you plug in a one, we said we got one. And when we plugged in a negative one, we got five. What do you get when you plug in three? Because you have three. What is it? Three cube root of nine minus six. What is that about? Isn't that going to be a negative value, or is it? Oh, okay. Point two four. What? Zero. Zero, and then it goes on. Okay. So there's our values. So you can see, and remember when we looked at the graph, we had it came down like this and then went like that. So at three, it must be like we're just going from like here to here kind of thing. So you can see by looking at the graph what's going on there. But we didn't even need the graph because where's the absolute maximum? Or not where, but what is the absolute maximum? Five. Five, and what's the absolute minimum? Zero. Yep. Okay, so the graph was not even needed. All you have to do is take all of the, take the derivative, set it equal to zero, or where it doesn't exist, and find those critical numbers. Then you take all the critical numbers and the endpoints and plug them in, and you just see where's the highest and lowest. All right, let's see what else we have here. Okay, so it's just another example, number 10 here. So find the global maximum and minimum, or absolute, remember, of this function here. So you guys try it on your own, and then we'll see what we get. So if you're at home, pause the video right now, try this on your own, and then turn it back on. Okay, so 
this. Let me unfreeze the camera. There we go. Okay, so I did the derivative. So the derivative g prime of x is 2 cosine of x plus 2 sine of 2x. Why do I have this 2 right there in front of the sine of 2x? Very good. Chain rule on that guy right there. So the derivative of cosine is negative sine, so we have negative cosine, so it's positive sine here. So positive sine of 2x and then times the derivative of the inner function or times 2. That's where that 2 came from. Okay, and then right here then, um, wait, okay, so I set it equal to 0 on the next step. By the way, is there any place where this does not exist on this interval? You have the sine function and a cosine function. Are they continuous on the interval from 0 to 2 pi? Just think about them individually. Is the sine continuous from 0 to 2 pi, and is the cosine continuous? Yeah, they're those, you know, sine looks like this from 0 to 2 pi, continuous on the whole thing, and, and cosine looks like this. So it doesn't matter if you put a 2, anything else in there inside with the angle there, or if you add them together, subtract them, whatever, because they're both individually continuous functions, then this is continuous on this. So its domain is all real numbers again. So it's continuous on that entire graph from 0 to 2 pi. You can put any um, angle you want in both of those, and you will always get an answer. So it's got all real numbers for the domain. Yeah? I have a question mm -hmm. on your third step, like g prime of x or of x. This one right here? Okay, so that's the step we're on. So good, good lead into where we're going. So I think you were out of the room when we talked about this, actually, Isis. So this is where we had to use our identity, that the sine of 2x is the identity 2 times the sine of x cosine of x. That's on that page that we had, trig, you had to memorize. So if you haven't um, looked at that recently, you probably want to look at it. So we just replaced the sine of 2x with 2 times the sine of x cosine of x. So then on the next step here, um, I set equal to zero, and I can't do this unless I can factor something out. So it, it looks out, it turns out, luckily, that it's got sine of x on both of these, and it also has a two. Two sine of co, cos, two cosine of x in each term. So I factored that out right here, and what was left was the one plus two sine of x. Now I've got them as two factors, and whenever we have factors that are multiplied like that and equal zero, we can use our zero product property. We can say, well, either the first factor equals zero or the second factor equals zero. So if you set the first one equal zero, you divide by two, you still get cosine of x equals zero, and that occurs, remember, we're only on this closed interval, so once around the unit circle, it occurs at pi halves and three pi halves. And then when you solve the one on the right there, we've got sine of x equals negative one half, and that occurs at 7 pi halves and 11, 7 pi 6, sorry, and 11 pi 6. Okay, so those are the four values that you should have gotten. Those are all the critical numbers. Right here, all the critical numbers. You got four of them. So we need to take them for our last step. Um, we need to say, what is f of each one of these? f of a half, f of 3 halves. 3 pi halves, not 1 half, pi halves, f of pi halves, f of 3 pi halves, f of 7 pi sixth, f of 11 pi sixth. And then we also need, don't forget the endpoints, we have to do f of 0 and f of 2 pi. Okay, so all of those things, all the critical numbers and the ends. What do you think the thing people leave off the most on these are? The ends, exactly. They forget to try the ends. Okay, um, and like I said, on the test, um, there are points for writing, not only finding all the critical numbers, but then even though you might know one is, is going to be the answer, you still have to show the work of plugging in all the critical, finding all the critical numbers, their y values, plugging them in, and then the same thing, finding the ends. You have to show all of this, even if you already know which one is the answer. Okay, so plug them in. Let's see, g of zero is the easiest because sine of zero is zero and cosine of zero is negative one. So this is negative one. 
Well, this is G of, not F. Sorry, our function was G, so these should all be G's here. G. G whiz. Okay. Um, that looks really sloppy. Let's just put G's on them. Okay, so go ahead and find all of them. Take a minute to do that. Those of you at home, you can pause the video and do that and then check again. All right, so these are our values that we got. We have our g of pi halves is 3, g of 3 pi halves is negative 1, g of 7 pi 6 is negative 3 halves, and that's also g of 11 pi 6. And then our endpoints, g of 0 and g of pi, or g of 2 pi, are both negative 1. So what is our absolute, max, absolute maximum or our global maximum? Three, yeah. What is our absolute or global minimum then? Negative three halves. Okay. It occurs, you notice we, we only say there is one absolute minimum value, but it, it occurs at more than one place, right? Okay. But it's just one value. Okay. All right. Let's move on. So, Relative extrema, extrema only occur at critical numbers. D so does that mean that all critical numbers are relative extrema? No, remember that point, where, that one where we had the, the point that went like that, where it went up and then it keeps going up as it goes to the right, but it has a sharp point, but it, that's not a high or a low point there. Um, you also could have, um, what if I had like the x, or the, this is y equals x cubed. See how it's got right here? It's got a, its slope right there is actually zero. If you could see it, you could see it's zero. It comes in, curves in there, and then curves back out. So its slope right at zero is zero. So that's a critical number. And if you did the derivative there, y prime is equal to three x squared, you'd see setting that equal to zero, you get x equals zero. So that's our critical number. But if you, Look at the graph. Does it have a high or a low point there? It doesn't. So not all critical numbers have to be extrema. But if you have an extrema, was it a critical number, a relative extrema? Not a maximum here, but a relative. If you, had a re if you have a relative extrema, did it have to occur at a critical number? What do you think? This one does rel um, relative extrema. Does that mean the critical numbers are relative extrema? We just said no. But are, um, do all relative extrema occur at critical numbers? This is kind of going the other direction. Yeah, they have to. There's no way that you can have a maximum or minimum unless you have a place where the derivative doesn't exist or where the derivative is equal to zero. So this one is yes. You, got, you just got to keep um, in stri it straight in your mind that when you get a critical number by setting the derivative equal to zero where it doesn't exist, that might be an extrema, but it doesn't have to be. But once you find extrema, they had to come from the critical numbers. You can't just magically come up with some other number some other way. Okay, so our endpoints critical numbers. Can they be, they're not critical numbers. No, we don't call them that, but can they be absolute extrema? Yeah, so critical, endpoints can be absolute extrema, but not relative extrema, all right? So just getting the terminology in there and what we're dealing with. Okay, so the next one here, the next thing we're looking at is the mean value theorem. So we've got some pictures here to kind of help us determine this. Oh, before we go on there, can you guys show me five to zero? Can you do the absolute extrema? Where are we at? Okay, all right. So let's go on to the mean value theorem. So for examples 11 through 16, we're supposed to draw these lines if possible. So first, part A, draw the secant line between the two points from A to B for where x equals a to b. So the secant line, a secant line is just a, a graph that crosses through um, two other points on another graph. So it's just the line from, say, here to here, going like that, okay? We want it to go through those two points. So there's a secant line drawn through those two points. So first do that on all of them. 
do it on 12 and on 13. Thank you, appreciate that. And on 14 and 15, where's A? Huh, there's A on 16. Okay. How come I can't draw one on 15? Yeah, there's no endpoint. There's no, it, there's an asymptote at A. So I can't even draw one on that. Okay, so that's the first thing you do is you just draw a line from a, between A and B that includes A and B there. And now it says, part B says, draw a tangent line that's parallel to the secant line. So for instance, on number 11 up here, my tangent line, it looks like I'd have to be about right here in order to get a tangent line that's parallel to that, in my case, the red line. Okay, so see, if, see how many tangent lines you can draw on each graph that are parallel to the secant line. How many can you draw on number 12? Yeah, two, you can get one right here and then one below it right there. How about 13? Is there any place you can draw a tangent line there? No, there isn't. There's no any point on there where you draw the tangent line. Now, and you can't do it up here because this is a sharp point. So there's, I mean, how many tangent lines could you draw there? It's an infinite number of tangent lines on that. And so we don't, we can't do our derivatives at sharp points. Okay, I'm trying to get the eraser. There we go. So that one I can't even draw anything on. Um, what about the next one on 14? Can you draw one there? Nope. Um, how about 15? Obviously, there's no line to start with, right? So we can't draw a parallel line to, for, to nothing. What about 16? Can you draw a parallel line on 16? You can, but there's not the point. There. Exactly. The point doesn't exist, so we can't do it. So I actually did this a little bit better here on my next slide so you can see them really well. So you can see on number 11 that there was uh, one tangent line, 12 had two, but the rest of them we could not draw a tangent line that was parallel to the secant line. So therefore, in order to draw a tangent line, can you tell me some things that would have to be true about the original graph for us to, like on 11 and 12? So what was true about 11 and 12 that is not true about 13 through 16? What do you think? Exactly. It's continuous. It has to be continuous, and it had to have, you could take the derivative, so we call that differentiable. And we can't take derivatives on endpoints, so technically it's continuous on the closed interval, so it includes the dots, but it's differentiable on the open interval not including those endpoints because we can't really do derivatives of endpoints. Okay, those two things have to be true in order for you to um, make sure that you have at least one tangent line there that's parallel to the secant line. So this leads right into the mean value theorem. Okay, so let's move on up here. Let's see about these two. So um, draw the secant line between the points um, two and where x equals two and five on each one of these. So can you tell by looking at it which ones you're gonna definitely be able to draw parallel lines? Based on what Isa said, where they gotta be continuous and differentiable, which two are you gonna be able to draw? Yeah, at least 17 and 19. Um, the problem on 18 is you've got this point there, this sharp point. So we might be able to, we might not. But we know at least on 17 we can draw our secant line there. And then where does it look like the tangent line occurs? At what x value? 
Yeah, it looks like at about 3, right? And they call it, for some reason, they called that point C and F of C. So our X value is now the C value. So this is at 3, about, about 3. We're just kind of getting abouts here. Okay, now on 18, if you draw from 2 to 5, from here to here, so did that sharp point come into play if it's actually an end point? No, it didn't, because we're only doing on the interval to here. All of these are on the closed interval from 2 to 5. So because it was continuous on the closed interval from 2 to 5 and differentiable everywhere in between 2 and 5, then therefore the mean value theorem applies on this particular interval. So we saw that sharp point, and it kind of threw us off a little bit, and we thought, oh, it's not going to apply. But you have to think about what is the interval you're actually doing this on. So what does it look like? Give me a kind of estimate. What do you think those x values are where those tangent lines occurred? Like 2 point something there. What do you think? Yeah, 2.5 and 4.5. That's good enough. He put 2.7 and 4.3, but if you had put 2.5 and 4.5, because it's just looking at a picture, you can't get that specific, right? Okay, the last one we draw from 2 to 5, and this time it looks like there's 1, 2, 3 parallel lines. You notice when I'm drawing these parallel lines, I don't draw them outside of this interval from 2 to 5. In other words, we're only talking about going from 2 to 5 here. So even though technically there is another tangent line down here, it's not in the interval from 2 to 5, so we don't include it. So those values, they look like it's somewhere between 2 and 3, so maybe about 2.5 and then somewhere between 3 and 4, so maybe 3.5, and then again between 4 and 5, so 4.5. Just a guess on what those are. All right? All right, so the actual mean value theorem is, oh, there's the same thing, the pictures of them, more nicely drawn, but we already did it, so let's just scoot on over. Okay, so the mean value theorem. So first of all, this theorem only applies if the graph is continuous on the closed interval and then differentiable on the open interval, this, you know, between the endpoints. So you have to check that first, because if you don't check that, you might go through all the work to try to find the place where there has a, t a, a parallel tangent line. And it won't even, there won't even be one, because maybe it wasn't continuous or wasn't differentiable. So you have to check that first. And then, remember, our slopes are just, um, uh, are just derivatives, right? So if I want the slope of the secant line, so if I do the secant line slope just using the slope formula, y minus y over x minus x, you know, we do the slope from one end to the other. So that would be the slope of this line over here from A to B, that blue line I just drew in there. And then we just want to know um, where is the derivative that have the same slope. So we, the same slope means they're equal. And then we just do the derivative of the original function. And that'll tell us where this occurs, this line here occurs. Okay, so informally, the mean value theorem states that given the right conditions of continuity and differentiability, there will be at least one tangent line parallel to the secant line. There has to be at least one. Um, in other words, the instantaneous rate of change or the slope of the tangent line has to equal the slope of the average rate of change or the slope of the secant line at least once in that interval. Okay, so here's an example, number 20. So you're given this function. Find all C which satisfy the mean value theorem. And when they say C, that's just the X's. These are X values. I don't know why they like to replace it with C. It would be easier if they just said find all the X values. <laughs> Find all the C which satisfy the mean value theorem on the interval where X goes from 3 to 6. So first of all, what do we have to check before we start doing any work? Right. Is it continuous on that interval? So look at your function. What's the only place where this is not continuous? At 0. You can't plug in a 0 there or you'll divide by 0. 
So is it continuous on the interval from three to six? Yeah, so we're good, it's continuous. Is it differentiable? What do you think? Yeah, it's differentiable on that interval too. Um, let's take the derivative and see what we mean. So our derivative here, um, this is the same thing as negative 6x to the negative 1, remember, that term. Derivative of 3 is just 0. So a derivative of negative 6x to the negative 1 is positive 6x to the negative 2, which is the same thing as 6 over x squared. So where does this not exist? What's its domain? Yeah, x can't be 0. So our original one, we had the domain as x cannot be 0. And then on our derivative, it has the same domain. So on the interval from 3 to 6, um, the derivative exists everywhere there, and it's continuous there. So we're all good to do the, the mean value theorem. And we actually have part of the mean value theorem done because we have to take the derivative. We have to first do that. And now we have to think, we want this derivative to have the same slope, so this derivative has to be the same or equal to the slope from the, of the endpoints. So how do I get the slope of this endpoints from 3 to 6? Um, plugging in 3 into the original function. Exactly. First do f of 3 to get that point. So 3 minus 6 over 3, or 3 minus 2, which is 1. Is that right? And then f of 6, 3 minus 6 over 6, or 3 minus 1 is 2. So that gives us the points 3, 1, and 6, 2. So do our slope with that. y minus the y-coordinate. y minus y, so the second y minus the first y, over the second x minus the first x. Or 6 over x squared is equal to 1 third. Did you guys get the same thing I did? Is that right, one third? Okay, we just solved this for x. Okay, so um, I'm gonna multiply both sides of this by x squared to get that off the denominator, and then multiply both sides of it by three to get that three off the denominator, and we end up with 18 equals x squared, or you could cross multiply there. Remember, cross multiply is only if, you're if you have a fraction equal to a fraction. You can cross and multiply these two equal to those two. It has to cross around an equal sign, though. It has to be one fraction equal to another fraction. Okay, and then we take the square root here. And we do, whenever we put square root in, we have to do plus or minus. Don't forget that. Big mistake people forget. And then we can pull a 3 out, so plus or minus 3 square root 2. Um, however, or you could have just left it square root 18. They don't care if you simplify. Now look, this is the biggest mistake on the test, is people are really good about putting that plus or minus in there, but then they don't look to see, all right, is it in the interval? So which is the only one that's in the interval? Right. So our C value is actually, it occurred here when x was equal to positive 3 square root of 2. Or you could have said just square root of 18. Okay. That's the only value inside there that, that has the same slope as the slope from the endpoints. Okay, that's the mean value theorem. Okay, now, let's keep, whoops. What if they asked you, since that's not on here, let's keep going here and do a little bit more with this. What if they ask you, um, what is the actual entire point? Or what's the y value of this? What would you do? Plug in that answer to the original function. Yeah, just plug it into the original function and get the y coordinate, okay? So don't don't overthink it. It's not really that hard. All right. Let me see five to zero. Can you do the mean value theorem? Okay, what's the first thing you have to check? Right. Is it continuous and differentiable? So you just check if it's continuous. So it's the domain of the function. Check if it's continuous on that closed interval. Then do the derivative. Check if it's continuous on that closed interval, too. And therefore, the derivative would exist there. Um, and then you just do your mean value theorem. You take your derivative of the function, and you set it equal to the slope from the endpoints. And you find the c value where it occurs. Okay? All right. That is it.